everybody. Uh, I'm thrilled to see some of you in the audience. There's actually a very large audience watching us online, so you'll have to bear with me. This is uh, my first time that I've presented where there's more people watching online, so hi to those folks. This is gonna be fun. You guys can tell me how I do. So um, I wanna talk to you today about Microsoft and the Dell engagement and relationship. For those of you who have been following um, us, you know, when Bill Gates started the company as a young man in 75, Michael was right behind him in 84 starting at Dell. Since that time, Dell and Microsoft have continued to collaborate and innovate. They really have maintained the curiosity and innovation to build technology to make people's lives better. You can see through this, you know, what we refer to as the wallpaper, that this collaboration has continued through our history. And actually, let me just show you a quick video that, um, that will give you more of an idea of what I'm talking about. My friends and I started with nothing but an idea that we could harness the power of the PC to improve people's lives. between Dell and Microsoft is essential to maintaining our business. If there's ever a problem, I can access Dell sales and service personnel 24-7. I couldn't have done it without Dell and Microsoft. Our job, our job, is to make sure that not only is PC not dead, but we're constantly innovating, reimagining it. And these are heroic companies. And, um, you know, it's not, we're not asking the consumer to put their hands in their pocket. We're actually asking the consumer to, to make these guys put their hands in their pocket. To have Dell and Microsoft announced on the same day is about as big a thrill as you can imagine. So that gives you an idea of how long we've been working together. Uh, it's interesting, I give a call out to Bono, my fellow Irishman, that was actually the announcement of the Red Campaign, and I don't know if any of you uh, know this, but both Microsoft and Dell have huge philanthropic um, escapades, and they joined together for that campaign back in, uh, I think it was like 2007. So, okay. Um, so, the world, there we go. So it, five years ago, we launched Windows 7, and in that five-year span, tablets have actually become mainstream. For those of you who remember five years back, uh, you know, you had e-readers, and we had a small number of tablets that were uh, beginning to come into market. Now, pretty much everybody has them. It's the same thing with smartphones. Since the launch of Windows 7, we had um, smartphones that were really seen as executive jewelry and for executives and companies. Now my kids have them. You know, so the world is changing, and what we see at Microsoft is that, you know, the collaboration with companies like Dell, we're continuing to innovate and try and drive that change. But more importantly, what we see is, transition is really slow, folks. What we see is that the companies that can keep up with this change are actually gonna be the companies that flourish in the 21st century. I wanted to show you guys an example. This is a photograph taken in St. Peter's Square in the Vatican for um, Pope Benedict on the right-hand side in 2005. What you can see in this photo is there's probably about three devices being used there. In 2013, it was Pope Francis, and I'm Catholic, I should know this, I should just roll right off, but Pope Francis gave the same inaugural speech in 2013, and what you can see in this photo is that there's literally nobody without a smart device who's recording uh, who's recording the event. This is a demonstration of just how quickly technology has moved from, you know, from something that we use in business to something that we want to use in work and in life. 
So for Microsoft, we're not satisfied with just building products that are for today. We're actually tracking against four mega trends. So for us, we're looking at what's going to be uh, what's going to be more ubiquitous in the coming decade. So what we see is mobility. You're going to see more and more mobile devices. You're going to see more and more uses for mobile devices, especially when you start getting into the internet of things and we start to manage to merge data and information. The other one that we see trending is social. So not necessarily you know, Facebook taking over, but we are seeing more and more products that companies are using to communicate within a company uh, using social media. So at Microsoft, of course, we have Yammer, uh, you have Link for IM, et cetera. So we see that trend continuing. Cloud, I remember five years ago trying to explain to people what cloud computing was. It was quite a tough discussion, but we see cloud continuing to grow. And the reason for that is that people want to have access and they want to be connected all the time. Nobody wants to have to go back and launch their desktop to get their family photos. Everything is being stored in the cloud and it's the same with work documents and work processes. We want to be connected and always available. And then finally, big data. So with the, um, at Microsoft we call it the internet of things and with the advancement of this and big data, so business intelligence, is basically the gathering of all of this data and turning it into information that we can use to make decisions both in work and in home. What I like to talk about for this, because I think it sounds um, quite lofty, is I use a smartphone and my smartphone gathers the data from traffic sensors using Cortana, so our product on Windows Phone, and then it communicates with my calendar and it lets me know when it's time to go pick up my son and what the best route to use is based on the traffic. And for anybody who knows me, it's very important because I'm never on time. <laughs> But uh, that is how we see big data progressing. So how is Microsoft reacting to this? You know, we have had a change in management. So we had Satya Nadala. He has been on as our CEO since uh, February. And in that time, we really hold in on our strategy. We are uh, a company that is focused on the productivity and platform for the mobile first, cloud first world. What that basically means is that uh, first and foremost, people are at the core of what we're doing from a software perspective. We want you to have a synchronized and a consistent experience regardless to where you're using the software, at home or at work. From a cloud OS, I kind of hit that a little bit. This is really just giving you access to what you want when you want it and it always being ready and on demand. And then finally, from a device and hardware perspective, we work with Dell to make sure that we are lockstep in our collaboration and innovation for hardware so that all of these scenarios light up with the software. So what next? So for any company who is not keeping up with technology, or for any company who's not keeping up with these changes, we think this is gonna be very difficult to take advantage of this new world. We have developed products and solutions, not only the Windows platform, but also in Office and Server. And I'm gonna take a few minutes to have a colleague of mine come up and take you through what they are. Stephanie Ubarra. Great, thank you. And thanks to all of you for giving me a few moments to talk about our Office and Server uh, solutions and hope that these are things that you're familiar with as you're using them in your business today and hopefully I can spark a few new ideas around areas where you can further optimize these products. So after we launched Office 2010, we went into our cycle that we always do and we start talking to our customers saying, what more would you like? I know sometimes it feels like everything but the kitchen sink is in Office, right? I mean, it continues to grow and morph and we continue to get great feedback from our customers on what more they'd like to see. So, you know, the, there's no end to this cycle. And the key feedback that came to us after Office 2010 was Office is a fabulous content creation suite of products. The problem is we think Microsoft, you could help us and we could do more together to help consume and um, collaborate around that content because really it's the content is not the end, right? It's about creating something that allows us to further some kind of a business objective. So this is a lot of the feedback we heard and, and maybe this resonates with you in your um, 
businesses. Employees, you know, there used to be the day where my mom and dad would get in the car, they'd drive, drive to the office, them and their 50 or so coworkers were right there in the office. Now we're in a global economy, global world. Either your customers are on the other side of the world, your fellow employees, and so how can we help bring that together? We don't see each other very often, right? We know how important personal contact is, and we all, I'm sure, try to travel a lot. Many of you are probably traveling here for this event, but we're all really refocusing on family, too, and, and trying to um, have that important engagement. And so how can we use technology with um, both our families and our business colleagues to help us come together in a more personal way? We hear, we don't have time to manage our IT, right? I'm in the widget business. I'm in the something else business. I'm not in the IT business. So we hear from our customers, make it easier for me. And then we also hear, we need all of our employees to use a full suite of create, collaborate, and consume applications so that we don't have compatibility issues. I don't know if this happens with you, but you start a meeting and somebody has one thing, somebody has the other, and it can take you 15 minutes to kind of get going on the same page. So as we started to develop the new office product, we came up with these four pillars, which were our focus areas. And each time we started thinking about a new feature, we talked about where could it slot in, or does it support one of these? So how can we help customers be more productive anywhere? How can we help them work better together? How can we help simplify the IT, but yet let the customer stay in control? Because it's not that they're asking us to just take it all. There's just a certain balance between what customers want to manage and where they'd like Microsoft to do the heavy lifting. And of course, they always want to get more for your investment. Who doesn't want to pay less and get more? So we, we released Office 365. And at the core of Office 365 are the applications. And there's been some confusion around this, so I want to spend a minute on this. The applications are similar to what you're always used to. You have Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook, OneNote, um, and Publisher, and they're all, so that's the full suite of applications included in Office 365, and they're all loaded locally on your device, so be it a PC, a tablet, or a phone. There's this misperception, I think, um, at launch, and, and we're continuing to get the word out, that it's not all about applications in the cloud. There is a piece of that that we'll talk about, but for the most part, the key applications are locally um, on your device and available to use, just as you're always used to. So, but where Office 365 goes beyond the, just the Office pieces, it brings a wraparound in terms of Office um, Microsoft hosted solutions. So again, this gets back to the customers where they say, you know, help us manage your technology, Microsoft. We love all of the capabilities, but it requires a lot of heavy lifting, right? We have to have an exchange server. We gotta have a SharePoint server. We gotta have a link server. Um, if we wanna do document storage and we do local, you know, we have to have our own local document storage solution. So Microsoft has taken all of those technologies and bundled them all up in an enterprise class warehouse that we run and said, let us take on that heavy lifting for you. Go ahead, focus on the things that you do in your business, and at the same time, we'll focus on what we do, and we will provide you reliable and fantastic um, technology. So along with the Office 365 product comes Microsoft 24-7 support, and it's also financially backed. We make a financial commitment to you for 99.7% uh, uptime, and so far we're, we're at five nines. We've well exceeded that. So again, that's our promise to you, is let us do the piece of the um, IT management, and let's give you the ability to really thrive and, and optimize that technology. And then another key tenant of Office 365 is Anywhere Access. So you heard Anne-Marie talking about that a lot. A couple scenarios. One is maybe you go to a customer site and you have a PowerPoint that you're gonna share. You get there, your battery's dead. Oh no, what am I gonna do? Borrow the customer's PC. Wow, lo and behold, no Office. Well, what do you do? So in addition to having the Office on your desktop device with the Office 365 subscription, you also get access to Office in the cloud. So it is true. It is also up there in the cloud. Go up there, sign in, load up your PowerPoint, you're right in business. So you will always have Office no matter what device you're on and where you are. Another piece about Anywhere Access is the way that people use technology has changed, right? We used to all be very tethered to our desktop. You're in work mode, you're sitting at your desk, you're on your desktop. And now more and more people are working on their phones, on their tablet devices. And so Office 365 takes a new approach. It used to be you buy a license, you put it on the computer, it sits on that computer and that is where you work. Now you have a license with Office 365 for a PC. It includes, so either Mac or Windows PC, it has a license for phone, both iPhone, Android, Windows phone. Again, we want to be where the customers are. And also a license for a tablet device. So right now we support Windows tablet as well as iPad. 
rumor has it there's Android on the roadmap. I know we're being filmed, so I'll just stop there and say uh, I would expect that um, to be available in the near future. So again, we're just trying to make all the software and solutions easy for you to manage and available for you anytime and anywhere with Office 365. And it continues to provide new updates and services. So at launch, um, we didn't have any iPad, we didn't have any iPhone, those are new additions. We had uh, SkyDrive, which is now OneDrive, and it was a 20 gigabyte offer. In addition to the seven gigabytes that everybody gets, we had a 20 gigabyte offer, and I thought, wow, that's fabulous. Okay, fast forward about a year and a half, we just announced probably six months ago, one terabyte, and I was just like, like one terabyte, that's amazing. I mean, I can imagine I will never run out of space with movies and photos and work content, and I could put everything up there. Well, we had some customers that were approaching that limit, and we thought, hey, why not? We have the scale, we have the data center, and so we've now just announced unlimited OneDrive storage, which is a fabulous feature with Office 365. So you can store to your heart's content. So in um, calendar year 2015, we'll be rolling that out to our customers that are reaching those thresholds. So again, just kind of closing back to the business pain points that we talked about earlier, and as we were thinking about how we build out the solution, this kind of just shows you the things we talked about. How we have created, I think, a great experience that allows you to do all of these things. Be productive anywhere, all of your devices, working better together. We have Link with high definition video and audio. We live on that at Microsoft. I hope that's something that you've all experienced, um, how fabulous that is. One click access on my phone when I'm driving home, I just hit a button, it dials me right into the meeting, no entering passcodes, no listening to hold music, it's fabulous. We help you protect what matters. We have our very secure database that we're able to manage with enterprise grade um, security, and, and you have the ability to benefit from that. And then building for tomorrow, like I said, Office 365 is ever evolving. We're continuing to add new features, new content, and, and you'll see that. That's just the future. There is no version number. Office 365 just is the solution, and it will continue to evolve, and that's where all of our new innovation and content will, will release. So what does that mean, um, how have we done? Well, looking at this just two years later, Office 365 is the uh, largest subscription service in existence. We have seven million users and it's growing at the fastest pace of any service in market. We also have in the past 12 months, 60% of the Fortune 500 companies that are in the process of deploying. And as you know, those large enterprises have very measured deployment cycles. And so we're just absolutely thrilled. This is well beyond where we expected to be at that inter uh, enterprise class deployment. So what does that mean for you? Hopefully, in your business, you're using Office 2013. If you are, I say thank you very much. That's fabulous, our latest suite. And now you might be sitting there thinking, oh, some of those other hosted services that she was talking about sound pretty good, but I've just made a pretty significant investment in the desktop applications. I can't just scrap that and start over. So don't worry, we've thought about that. Obviously, our best customers. And we have programs that allow you to just add the wraparound for the Office 365 services. And then you continue to leverage your investment in the desktop applications that you've already purchased. For those of you that aren't running Office 365 or Office 2013 yet, this is a great opportunity for you to go ahead and, and subscribe to the full service, a predictable, um, manageable solution that allows you to benefit from really all of those enterprise class services and focus on the things that are more important to you in your business. So let's transition and let's talk a little bit about servers. So Anne-Marie talked to you a bit about cloud OS, and we've been doing a lot of thinking and reimagining about what the data center looks like of the future. And as you know, probably Sachin Nadala, our current president, came from our world of server. Once upon a time, and for many years, it was called server and tools, server and tools. It was, seemed like every other division in the company had reorged, but server and tools remain very consistent. Well, we've really been through an evolution in the past year, and one way that you know that a lot of things are changing at Microsoft is you start to see reorging and names change. So that division now, formerly known as server and tools, is cloud and enterprise. And that division is focused exclusively on delivering one consistent platform that can help support you and your business in the way that you want to work. So are you looking at on-prem? Are you looking at private cloud, public cloud, hybrid? We support all of it. We look to you to know what is the best and right fit for your business. And then we provide that one single solution that allows you to easily transition and migrate through those different business models. 
So at the core of all of that is Windows Server 2012 R2, of course, our operating system. And if you've been watching the hardware market recently, um, you've seen that the pace of innovation in server hardware and the capacity that's available now is astounding. A uh, few things that we should call out on Dell, if you've not seen or if you're following Dell, probably many of you that are here, their Vertex server. It's phenomenal. It's a converged solution with um, storage, um, storage, compute, and networking all in one box. The box could fit under the desk in my home office. It's probably smaller than the computer I used, the desktop computer I used in college, and it's certainly quieter. So phenomenal technology, optimized again to run Windows Server 2012 R2 standard and data center for high capacity virtualization scenarios. Dell has also just released their new generation of PowerEdge 13G servers. Again, another great example of hardware highly optimized to take advantage of all of the great features and capabilities that we have in Windows Server 2012 R2. So what we hear a lot of time from our customers is, oh, we love Server 2012 R2, it's great features, great functionality, but transition is hard. It takes time, it costs money, and maybe good enough is good enough. And really what that good enough has been is Server 2003. Fabulous product, but let me repeat again, Server 2003. I don't know how many of you are still driving cars that are 10 years old, let alone running your business on a software that is 10 years old. So lovingly, it is time now to say goodbye to Server 2003. On July 14, 2015, that is the end of support date for this product. So what does that mean? What that means is that Microsoft will no longer be releasing any critical or security or any updates of any kind for that product. And what you may not know, because you're thinking, oh, it's been around for a long time, probably got all the bugs, kinks worked out. Well, the reality is if you track security, it's a never ending game of cat and mouse and you always have to be innovating and staying ahead. I'm sure you saw in the news recently, there were a number of US retailers that had um, credit card hacks and created all kinds of challenges. Well, in the past year, we released 38 critical updates to keep maintaining that security level that is Microsoft standard for Server 2003. So how many will we release after July 14, 2015? None. That means that any use of that platform in your environment is vulnerable. So again, not to panic, we still have 251 days. So what can we do about that? Three easy steps. We say the first step is discover, do an audit on your environment. You might think, oh, we're pure, right? We're all moved, we're on 2008, we're on 2012. Well, what we found as we've worked with our customers is um, the infrastructure is oftentimes very complex and they will more often than not have a Server 2003 app or something that's running in a, in a silo somewhere. So make sure you're doing a good search through your entire infrastructure. See which applications you have are at risk. Is it time to retire and replace some of those applications? Are they maybe compatible with Server 2012 so there's nothing holding you back? Or um, is there some development that's needed for some highly specialized applications because it's just critical to your business? So after you've been through the discovery process, then it's time to target. This is a great moment in time to kind of step back and assess, is this right for the cloud? Obviously with Office 365, it's a great uh, way for you to offload some of that um, heavy lifting and focus on more your business. There may be some other things, um, around medical records or legal sensitivities, things that have certain regulations, where you need to keep those local and on-site. So just about designing the plan. What's cloud ready, what's private, public, and what does your hybrid strategy look like? And then finally, you move on to the migrating. So this is the step that takes the most time. We say that the average end-to-end -end process is around 200 days to build a server migration plan. So we're right in the moment now where it's time to start running. We'll have a great session later today, so we'll give you a chance to get some lunch. Thank you for being here during your lunch hour, by the way. So at 1.30 in room 9B, we'll have some of our Microsoft server specialists as well as some Dell hardware specialists there to present uh, you and share with, uh, to share some of the great tools and um, services that are available to help you through this process. So I hope if you get a chance that you can stop by there and um, Look forward to helping you power your business to great success with Microsoft Server and Office. Thanks, Stephanie. How many days did you say was left? 
200 day, oh, 212, or is it 21? I may be just Does anybody in the audience? 221? 51. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, we clearly are okay. Deep, briefly, be, breathe deeply. 51 would be a problem, but 200 days, we have more than 200, so as long as you get started now, we should all be in great shape. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Stephanie. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pop back to Windows. So showing you this, I just wanted to give you a sense of how broad the platform is today for Windows. I mean, we have 1.5 billion users on Windows. I'm sure most of you in the audience, if not all of you, are using Windows. And we also have over a billion users on Office. As we move to Windows 10, what we're moving to is one product family. And the, what we mean by that is that the product family would actually span from the smallest device, so when we talk about uh, sensors, Internet of Things, all the way up to our largest devices. <gasps> Don't know what happened there. All the way up to our largest devices, uh, which for us is our 82-inch um, large screen format, and then all the way down to your smartphones. So no matter what device you're using, whether or not it's your smartphone, Xbox with a 10-foot uh, gesture commands, or whether or not it's your tablet or your notebook, it will be the same consistent platform and the same user uh, experience. I thought this was interesting to share with you. You know, this convergence has been a journey for us. We started it with the launch of, two, of Windows 8. And when we launched Windows 8, then we launched Windows 8 Phone, and at that time, we took advantage um, of starting to merge the kernels together. Then when we went ahead and launched Xbox One, it was actually built on top of Windows 8, so big Windows as we call it. As we rolled into 8.1, we brought the phone and big Windows together, and now with Windows 10, everything is coming together. So all the way from the phone, all the way through Xbox to the large devices, with the launch of Windows 10 next summer, everything will be running on the same kernel, the same foundation. We're the only company that has a ubiquitous platform from beginning to end. Alrighty, so who cares? What's in it for business? So the Converge platform, I've already covered, it's going to have a consistent, um, a consistent and predictable look and feel. You can go from any device, swap between devices, and you'll have the same, same experience. We're also, as I mentioned earlier, designing this so that you can use it either at work or at home. So there's not going to be any of this flipping back and forth between your OS and your experience, whether or not you're scheduling to pick up the kids or a birthday party or scheduling to have your review with your boss. It's going to be the same. The other thing that we've spent a lot of time on, and we're doing a lot of work with Dell um, on, this, on this, actually, is around security. So we're adding more and more functionality, both in the hardware and the software, to protect companies and our own personal data from some of the modern threats. Stephanie covered this off as well. We're also building that into both server and office, so that across the Microsoft productivity and platform solutions, we will have higher securities. And then finally, continuous innovation. So we're getting away from this, you know, buy it, and then the new version comes out and you do a wipe and reload. We're getting away from that, and then what we will have going forward is that we will just update you on the device that you have today. So, a lot of talking here, huh? This is getting kind of boring for you guys. I'm gonna jazz it up. I'm gonna bring up Marlo Daly. He's our worldwide lead for device evangelism, and he's actually gonna show you the product. Hi, Marlo. Hey, how's it going, Emery? Pretty good. Well, um, as Emery said, I want to show you for the first time, maybe it's not the first time, what Windows 10 is all about. You can see the screen right here. But before I actually show you the, the product, um, I want to tell you a few things about it. First of all, one of the things we're trying to do with Windows 10 is take feedback. We want you to help us deliver the best experience possible. And so I'm going to tell you this now, and I'm going to tell you this at the end of my discussion. Go ahead, find an old PC or a tablet or something that you have lying around, and load the Windows 10 technical preview on it. Because we need your feedback. That's one of the things we've been taking. In fact, one piece of feedback we've heard loud and clear when we launched Windows 8 was, oh no, you've gotten rid of my start button. Help, it's gone. I don't know, I'm just lost. No start button, it's gone. He doesn't well, even take caffeine, guys. <laughs> and so we took that feedback, and in Windows 8.1, we added 
the little start button back. But you still said, but that's not enough because I push the button and it goes to the screen and there's just tiles and uh, I'm lost still. And we actually heard this from enterprises and people saying, we just can't figure this out. So lo and behold, now I'm hoping most of you haven't heard this. You can provide me feedback. If you like something, you can go woo or clap. If you don't like it, go chirp, chirp, chirp. Okay, here we go. Look on your screen. Here is the new start button. The start button's there. You click on it and it opens up in what you who are using Windows 7 are familiar with. It makes you feel warm and cozy because you see, ah. Oh, it's okay. like our security blanket. It's my little, my nanny blanket. And it's there and it looks like the familiar th things that you're used to. We did hear this feedback and we're taking it seriously. So other pieces of feedback you have. People said, you know, that's really nice, but is, what about those tiles? And interestingly enough, a lot of people actually like the tiles. They like the live tiles. So you can see right there on the live tiles, I have information coming up on those tiles about the election, in, my, in this one live tile here about people, updates. And that was good. People actually liked the live tiles. They were, some, people, some people were confused, but we got a lot of positive feedback. We also got a lot of positive feedback about some of the Windows 8 store apps. Those are the apps you have to get through the store. You know they're clean because they've been scrubbed and evaluated to make sure that we, that they're all, they don't, there's no virus or malware in them. They're also easier to acquire. They're easy to update. There's not a, a huge process. And so we got some positive feedback. The fact that people like that. They like those apps. And so we still have them. And in fact, this is a nice, this start menu is a nice merging of the good and the better. So the stuff that you're familiar with, but we also added some of these nice things over here. Now, it's really easy to get things into that start menu. So I'm gonna show you a few things. I go to all apps and oh, look, all my apps are right there. Oh, Doctor Who, I wanna put that right over here and you can see it pops right in the start menu. Or I can say, let's say Excel. I'm looking right here at the bottom, I'm just typing in the little um, search button. And let's see, Excel, there it is. I can right click on Excel and I can either pin it to the start, and I'll do that right now, or you can see I've already got it pinned to the taskbar. So now when I go into the start button again, there's my Excel. Notice that it's not just the Windows 8 store apps that are in that little live tile, easy to touch if I'm on a touch screen. It's also the old Win32 apps. So really there's no difference between the Win32 apps and the Windows 8 store apps. But wait, you say, Marlo, come on. When I open up the, those new fangled apps see thingsy, doesn't it take over my whole screen? Did you ask me that? I have asked you that many times. I was, and you, I'm, well, so let's go ahead and try something. I'll pop open the store. Here's the Kindle. Oh, you're right, it does take over my whole screen. But wait, there's gotta be something easy. So guess what? I can make it a little, yay, woo! I heard one yay. That's really nice. I have this full on thing, but I can also turn it into a window. And that was kind of a funny comment I would hear sometimes. Why can't, you know, it's called Windows. Why can't you make it into smaller windows? But it's here, I can resize it if I want. In fact, let me open up the mail app. So here's the mail app. It's a Windows 8 store app. And nice thing about it is I can resize it a couple different ways. And depending on how I size it, it actually adjusts to the size. So it's not just the fact that these apps are new. It, it knows how much space you have to work with and it adjusts. Responsive rendering. And so it allows you to build a lot of different types of apps that respond to the size. So they don't just get smaller or just um, as far as the size does it get smaller but it actually changes the way it behaves. Now this is important because Anne-Marie pointed out that we have one OS that covers the itty bitty devices all the way up to our huge devices. And what I just showed you there is why it's important for different applications that live on that platform 
to adapt to the size of the device that's using it. Because we are going to have one app platform. In other words, you, you buy an app in the store and it goes to different places you want to use it, which makes it much easier for you as an enterprise. Now, I'm not done yet. I wanted to point out something else I like about this start menu. Oh look, it just pops up and I can still see my other stuff going on. It doesn't take over my screen. It doesn't take over your screen. Now, if you are on a tablet or you actually said, hey, I, I kind of like that big screen and having all my apps there, you can go into the taskbar and change that setting. So by default, when you press the start menu, you still get the old Windows 8.1 update. Some devices, actually, it makes sense to have that big screen. Other devices, you may go, well, I just have a mouse and a keyboard, so I don't want it. It's up to you. There's a little start, right in the start button, the power button, right there. It's back. It's familiar. Thank you. I like that power button. I still remember, funny joke, uh, in the early 90s when the start button first appeared, people would joke and say, why do you have to press the start button to shut down? And then when you took it away, no, you took my way to shut down away. Okay. Kindle, got my apps right here. Talked about that. We've talked about resizing the apps. We've also mentioned, let's say I want to resize this bar. I can do that too. Grab it right like this. I can resize my start menu so it doesn't have to be you know, the same way, if I make it bigger, I've got my most used files, I click on File Explorer. Now when I'm on File Explorer, when I hovered, notice it popped up and showed me some frequent fi files. We're making it easier for you to find the things you do most with. So, something else. How many of you in the audience know what Alt-Tab does? You can raise your hand. Alt-Tab, you guys are awesome. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, either you're asleep or you're not paying attention, um, or maybe you're part of the 90% of people that have never used Alt-Tab. We, we, we collect a lot of information from people on how they use Windows in various situations, and 90% of people never used our Alt-Tab. So we said, this is so powerful, it makes it easy to get around. So, what do we do? Down here at the bottom of my corner, I've got a little tab thing that does all tab for me. It shows me the different windows I have open on that screen. Now on this specific desktop I have two, but notice at the bottom there's something else going on. Guess what? I have multiple desktops in Windows 10. That's something that we people said we want to be able to have environments that are dedicated to a specific purpose. So it's not just about switching apps, it's about creating entire desktops. So for example, Let's say I'm, this is my work desktop. Doing some Word, doing some Excel. Ooh, look at that, that's a nice, nice little list there. And then I wanna go to my play desktop. So I can swipe to the left, so I'm swiping to the left, or use the keyboard and mouse to click that button down there. And you can see, let's go to, oh, this is my home screen. And I can bring up some Kindle apps, I can bring up the mail desktop. I'll close this down. Oh look, here's, I'm, on, I'm on a folder, a complete separate folder, recent folders. So it shows me a nice way to get around easier. I've got my PC settings on a different desktop, and I'm clicking down here, you can see the ones that I know are active because they have a little tiny shading at the bottom. You can see that little shading at the bottom? That says that this one is open and doing something right now. So I can navigate to my different environments very easily. I can either left swipe or I can click on this button right here called getting back and forth. One last thing I'll show you is Snap Assist. I take something like PC settings, whoop, to the, to the, I click it to the right or to the left in this case, and you can see it actually pops up two other alternatives that said it's asking me, what do you want me to fill this other part of the screen with? And I go, oh, I want you to fill it with Internet Explorer, right like that. And boom, it just fills the other half of the screen. Sometimes you're doing that all the time. So I can swipe stuff back and forth. And um, Those are just a few of the innovations we've added in the user experience. 
There's a lot more to become. To come. There is a lot more coming in the next several months before Windows 10 launches. Um, you, if you download the technical preview, you'll get updates on a regular basis. I will encourage you, do not put it on your primary machine. It is a development. It is, it is a program that is in development at the time. There are bugs. We expect there to be bugs. But in your companies, as you try to evaluate, does this make sense? Put it in front of some people who are using Windows 7 or Windows XP right now and get their feedback. Start testing some of your apps. Because I think you'll be really pleased if you're running a Windows 7 environment on how compatible Windows 7 apps are on Windows 10. How little, you don't have to do a lot of re-engineering or tweaking. So that's, that's the positive stuff. This is the UI, and hopefully you love it because I think it's pretty cool. Um, now I think I want to talk with Anne Marie about some of the stuff that is not happening on the screen, <coughs> the, some Under of the, the stuff hood. that is happening behind the hood. There you Under go. Under the blankets. Yes. So let's go to the next slide. On the big, we're switching up. On the big screen. On the big screen. Oh, there we are. There we are. Okay. So this I think is really interesting. You know, I gave you guys my spiel a few minutes ago, but I did want to ask <laughs> Marlo, what does it mean this, uh, the way we live and the way we work? I mean, what are, what are the advantages of Windows 10 um, for how we live and work? Explain this to us. Yeah, so the live and the work thing, it's, it's a nice, it makes, you know, sounds nice. It makes it, when I'm at home using whatever devices I'm using, wouldn't it be great if the same way I worked with them was the way it was at work? And in fact, if you talk about the different types of devices that people use, whether it's a tablet or a phone or a PC or their, you know, whatever else. Their family all in one. Family all in one, or maybe they're like Bill Gates and have a huge perceptive pixel in their bedroom there or something. There you go, yeah. Um, but whatever, it's, it would make it so much easier if you can take everything you learn and do on a regular basis at home and apply to your work. It means that you don't have to do as much learning about those tools at work. You're familiar with them. And that's one of the great things about having the platform that spans all of those categories. Okay, not bad, not bad. You, you add that, you buy that? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll go with that. Okay, Groovy. So then um, I, I said this also, Stephanie talked about protection, she talked about uh, modern threats. I mean, what are we doing? Like, what are we really doing under the hood that's going to make a difference? Good question. So in Windows 8, I don't know if you know about Windows 8 very much, but we added a lot of innovation into protecting your information. BitLocker, for example, was a Windows 8 innovation. Um, that there's TPM chips, encrypting information. You hear about all these different threats that are coming, uh, that are around in this world. Windows 10, we upped the ante. We're making it easier for companies in the way that Windows 10 logs in in businesses to have two-factor authentication. So it's you know, when you, sometimes you go to websites and it will send you a text if you log into your bank account and says, oh, did you really log in? We know that businesses have asked us to make it easier to incorporate that whole method, that two-factor authentication, into the OS. And so we did that. We've also... So that's actually built into Windows that's 10. That's built into Windows 10. So okay. the, the hooks and the ability to do that uh, as, as an enterprise decides to do that is built in. There's also... Uh, this concept pretty of, good. You like that? That's pretty good. Woo! Yay! There's also this well, concept... I don't know if anybody else in the room, but apparently I spent $1,700 on Christmas Day at Target last year, or last Christmas. So <laughs> I, was, uh, I was one of those unfortunate people that was shopping at Target when I was actually having Christmas dinner. So I am actually very pleased about these advances. These two-factor authentication is pretty important. Um, also biometric authentication. So let's say you want to use your thumbprint better tools to allow you to do that. But something else that people have asked and businesses have asked us about is, can I put encryption on files? So that just because someone has access to that file, when it's no longer inside the corporate system, it still retains that protection. And so there are other types of, of protections we're building in Windows 10. Would this also protect celebrities' nude photos? Yeah, I bet it would. Okay. As long as they were encrypted so or we'll have a target locked audience in. right there. <laughs> Celebrity nude photos and the target buyers. 
Okay. We're having fun. <laughs> but those are some. Those are some. Just two of two of the concepts. No, I'm not done. I, I've got a couple more for you. you oh, good. Okay, Let's go. I've got a couple more. So, you know, people are used to we launch a new OS, they potentially buy a new piece of hardware, or they wipe their system and then they install the new OS. Ugh. We're I know, right? Take us into the modern age. How is this changing? So picture this, Anne Marie. I'm picturing. I I log onto my computer in the morning. Doodly -doo. I get a little notification. Hey, please update your OS. I go, okay. I click a button. About 20 minutes later, sound just like that sound effect. Magic. My OS is completely refreshed, it's rebuilt, everything's new. But will it not break some of the apps and APIs that I have on the previous version? How does this That's work? what it's not supposed to. So you can you as a corporate could create images that it's no longer a wipe and reload, it's actually an in-place update with an OS. In fact, when you go through, if you have a Windows 8.1 and you go through the process of actually putting the Windows 10 technical preview, I, I was amazed. I mean, and I'm, not, I'm not joking. It took about 20 minutes after the download took place. It's a pretty big download. Just a zoop, and my entire system was refreshed. It got all of my old settings, all of my old files. Hmm. It refreshed everything in place. And, and you're going to see in Windows 10 a lot of innovation into that process. In other words, making it easier for companies to deploy entirely new operating systems or the updates. Because we know, we've heard that, I say that, that, that we hear, we've heard that companies want that to be easier. Okay. App Store is another good one, is an app store for business. That's so I've got right. an app, I want to deploy this to my business. How do I do that on other op operating systems? It's really challenging. So having an app store that you as a business own and can deploy out to everyone in your enterprise. I think you did a pretty good job. Is that, did that give you, yeah. that's just, those are just a few of the things that are coming. We'll bring you back. Excellent. All righty. Cool, well thanks, Emery. Thank you, Marlo. All right, I'm gonna let you guys get out of here, but before I do, what I just wanted to mention was, you know, to consider your deployment options as you think about Windows 10 and whether or not you're going to upgrade. If you are currently evaluating Windows 8, keep going. Don't stop, and when Windows 10 comes, you'll be upgraded. If you're running Windows 7, what we suggest is that you consider Windows 8 for any of those touch scenarios, um, touch hardware touch scenarios between now and Windows 10, and then when Windows 10 comes, you can upgrade again. So just giving you a little sense of how we think about this. And then finally, I just wanna close with what Marlo mentioned. You know, we are inviting, we have a, we are all developing active listening skills at Microsoft, and we invite you to download the beta version and to give feedback. We're looking for feedback from everybody and anybody, so please go ahead and do that. And then finally, if you go to windows.com, we have a Windows Insider program that you can also join. And maybe this isn't something for you, but maybe this is something for like a tech enthusiast or your IT department, for them to download it, give us feedback, try it. And as Marlo said, it will be, uh, it's a work in progress, so we are looking for people to discover bugs and glitches along the way, but it will be available summer of 2015. That's it, folks. Thank you very much.